So today I will be giving a small introduction on what machine learning is, why is it useful? And I think more importantly, uh, I think one question that everybody should ask is what is it different doing from traditional programming, right? I feel like a lot of us don't understand that one thing. They say machine learning is a big hype, but people don't really understand how is it different from your usual programming, right? Also with this, I'll be giving a very small demo on linear uh, regression. Like that's the very basic model that you come across whenever you look at machine learning, right? And I'll be explaining very basic things. I won't be getting too much into the mathematics of it because half of machine learning is just mathematics, yeah? So yeah, and this is my Twitter handle. If you guys want to reach out to me, please feel free. Or always uh, up for a good chat, yeah? So, I think one of the key things you always need to ask about any topic is what is it, right? So what is machine learning, right? In a very vague sense, uh, assuming like many of you are here for, for the first time hearing about machine learning. So machine learning is just basically the ability of any computer program, right? To learn, understand and retain information. So it, I think you guys have already come across a lot of machine learning applications, right? Like autonomous driving, movie recommendations, Netflix, I know a lot of you Netflix nerds and autonomous driving Teslas and uh, also another uh, key place that machine learning is used is in research, right? Okay. So from traditional programs, uh, they are always well defined, whereas in machine learning, there's a learning that always happens and what the learning is, I'll keep, I'll show you in the other slides, yeah? And more formally, it's a way of uh, combining computer science and mathematics, okay? So this is basically a writing uh, algorithms and statistical models, statistical and mathematical models, actually, they both come in hand in hand to enable computers to learn and make decisions based on their learnings, right? So how is it really different from traditional programming? Like, what is it that, why do we need machine learning when you already have um, traditional programming? What is it really solving, right? So one of the key places where machine learning, I would like to give, I'd like to give you a good example is let's just say, let's define a problem, right? Let's define a problem where you have to identify somebody's face, right? Now, if you have to define somebody's face, and in a in a traditional programming sense, what would you do? You typically write a software to look for something that's of skin tone color, right? That has eyes, so you define how the eyes look. Probably say they're oval in shape, right? You write a small algorithm to find ovals around in, in an image, right? And probably you'd also say, hey, look, the eyes have to be within this uh, radius of this skin tone, have to be, the face has to be oval in shape. So, you know, in me in explaining all of this, you can already see the complexities that keep coming in, in traditional programming. It's hard to define all of this in a computer and define them in such a sense that it is easy to generalize them across multiple places, right? Let's just say I defined this problem for a sense where if the photo was taken perpendicular to your face, it was it is very easy to define how a face looks. Right? But if the photo is taken up a different angle, you know, you start falling into all these edge cases in the traditional programming sense that are very difficult to define in traditional programming, right? So that's why machine learning will uh, solve such program, uh, su uh, it's such a use case, right? So generalization is one, complexities, right? You can't really define every single uh, corner case when it comes to uh, traditional programming. It's almost impossible to define in the sense of identifying faces, right? Time consuming. Right, so you're, you're again running into the problem of defining every single case and running into millions of edge cases in this case, right, specifically. And in general, when you see machine learning models compared to traditional models in these use cases, they're always more highly more accurate and efficient. That means they take less time also to compute and they're also more accurate than traditional programming, right? So in traditional programming, you're always feeding in, so you have a well-defined boundary in traditional programming. That means you say, hey, look, this is the input and this will always be the output, right? In that sense, you have a well-defined algorithm. You always define edge cases for it. Let's just say you're, you're taking division by zero, right? So that edge case is already covered if you're doing division, right? And in this case, finding square root of a number, right? In machine learning, you feed in data and you feed in the output. Whereas in traditional programming, you feed in the data and the program to the computer, right? So when I say data and output, uh, in the sense of identifying faces, is just basically you say, hey, look, this is a face. And in the face, you'll also feed annotations. Annotations are basically, you're going to tell the program, hey, look, the face starts from here, the eye starts from here, okay? And you label basically that image, like a million, like how many ever, uh, data sets you want, right? You define it in that sense, and you feed it to the program, and hopefully you 
hope that whatever model you build is able to identify your face and is able to give good results, right? And you feed that program back into a computer. It ultimately, everything runs back on a computer. Right? And some of the con co common misconceptions of machine learning, right? Uh, machine learning is actually a subfield of AI. Now, AI falls under a really huge domain. The whole point of AI is to actually uh, be able to solve problems, right? To make software solve problems like how humans do. Okay, that's the whole point of machine learning. Oh, sorry, um, artificial intelligence. Whereas machine learning is a subfield of it, right? Where we try to solve problems in a more statistical way, right? Statistical and mathematical. I think those go hand in hand. Every time I say statistical, it's taken as mathematical, right? But with the help of computers, right? Because they're more highly accurate and they are pretty fast, right? And deep learning is again falls under machine learning. It's just uh, doing what machine learning is doing, but doing it with a lot, lot, lot more data and a lot more understanding. Okay. So what are the types of machine learning? So typically machine learning falls under three main domains. Okay. Supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. So what is supervised learning? So supervised learning is, uh, like I said, in the image identification itself, I already have the data and I already also have labels for it. So if I were to take a case of me identifying what are cats and dogs, what I would do is I'd give this program, I would say, hey, look, this is the image of a cat. And also I would say, hey, look, this is what a cat is. Like I, like I would say, this is, I put an image and I would put the label for it. This is what a dog is. And I feel it like million examples like these. And I'd hope that the program picks up on identifying a general pattern across these images that I've sent. So this is how a cat looks, this is how a dog looks. Right? So that is supervised learning where you actually have data and you have labels. So these are the two important things you need to remember. You have data and you have labels. Whereas in unsupervised, I think one very excellent example in unsupervised learning is if you guys use uh, Google Photos, right? Um, you've seen, uh, I don't know if anybody, any of you have realized that when you go to Google Photos, it actually groups your photos together, right? If you go to Google Photos, it's group my photos, it's group my friends' photos, and you can actually tag it. So that's a very uh, common uh, use case of unsupervised machine learning where you just know uh, you can create clusters of data. So let's just say I put in like a bunch of animals. Okay. I put in a bunch of animals and you will tell the program, hey, look, these are all animals, right? But go find ones that are similar to one another. So you'll go find every dog. Uh, they'll say, hey, look, this almost looks like this dog, right? So that's basically unsupervised learning. You don't really have labels. That means you don't know the final out output of it. But you say, hey, look, this is the, this is how general, uh, you, you define a general program for it. And you say, the program to go find patterns in that, right? So that's the keyword. I think patterns is the keyword that you need to remember when it comes down to supervised learning. And in the case of reinforcement learning, so in reinforcement, in reinforcement learning, you have a well-defined problem, right? Not, uh, yeah, you have a well-defined problem. And in that problem, you define what you call as uh, punishments and uh, rewards, rewards and punishments. Yeah, those are the two, two keywords you need to keep in mind. And let's just say, uh, let's take a self-driving car itself, right? If you were to take the self-driving car and tell the car, hey, look, uh, drive yourself from point A to point B, right? When it's driving itself, uh, if let's, let's just say it's at an interse intersection and at the intersection, the car starts to move forward, but there's another car arriving on the other side. So you tell the car, hey, look, that's bad, right? Because there's another car arriving at that intersection. You need to wait till the car passes for you to move, right? So you basically penalize it for doing an action like that. And you'd also reward it for it to wait and move. Right, so that is reinforcement where you are actually teaching the model as it is um, learning. Okay, so you're going back and forth with the model, and typically all big models that you see now that are capable of uh, achieving all these insane things. Like I don't know if you guys have come across uh, Chat OpenAI.com, so that's one Chat GPT. Tesla uses reinforcement learning extensively in their uh, models to teach how to actually drive. Right. And I'll be talking about some of the applications of machine learning. So where do you really see machine learning? In these three main domains, right? In supervised learning, they use it for classification and regression. So regression falls under prediction. Now, uh, everybody's aware of uh, stock price predictions, right? So that's where you, you can use regression models. They're all used, for, if you see, if you already have enough data of past uh, occurrences, you can predict the future. That's what regression does. Classification is more on the sense of identifying cats and dogs, right? But you already have uh, predefined labels, right? You would say this is a cat, this is a dog, right? 
damage linearity reduction this typically comes under like if you have a lot of labels right you have a bunch of data okay uh, and you really want to know which are the important parts of that data that's where dimensionality reduction comes is a little bit more advanced topics and clustering like i've told you already is you have a bunch of data and you have patterns in that data and you want to identify patterns in that data so that's where clustering comes the clustering comes is used in ex extensively in recommended systems quite aware of that and they also uh, in customer segmentations that they identify who are the better um, uh, leads for certain companies right and the reinforcement learning like i've told you tesla is a very good example where they teach the model as it is learning itself right right and some of the steps in machine learning i think one slide before this specifically in machine learning that i definitely had to add is if what do you need to know to actually learn machine learning right i feel like a lot of people just learn the computer science part of it that's just saying hey look put some inputs get some outputs but I feel like you need to really understand that machine learning, 90% of machine learning, I would say, 80 to 90% of machine learning is really built off of just your statistics and your mathematics, right? That is like your key thing that you need to understand. Like you need to be really strong in your uh, statistics, right? Hypothesis testing and all these various uh, basic statistical stuff, right? I feel like a lot of us miss out on really understanding the fundamentals of it and try to get into apply applying models. Like that's good. But please, anybody if you who's pursuing any uh, role or trying to pursue machine learning, I like to highly recommend you to learn your uh, metrics and your uh, statistics specifically. Right? So we'll be talking now about steps about machine learning. Okay. So what are the steps in machine learning? So in, typically in machine learning, you always come with a business problem, right? A business problem or you have a problem for something, right? So in machine learning, you always have data. You always collect data, be it a problem that you're even trying to achieve for the first time. You try to take general directions on what uh, the problem can be like, right? Let's just take the problem of uh, linear regression. Let's just take the problem of house price prediction. So if I were to predict the house price of some place in Bangalore, let's just take Kaur Mangla for that matter. Now, in this, if I were to predict what I would do, I would generally go to uh, places in Kaur Mangla. I'd find the uh, locality, I'd go to a bunch of different places and I would collect data like what is their rent or if I'm trying to buy the whole house, what is the whole price of the whole house? How many how many floors does it have? What is the, how many rooms does it have? What is the square footage? You can, you collect as much data as possible. And one thing in machine learning you learn, like there's always, obviously never, there's no such thing as too much data, okay? Collect as much as data. So then you end up with raw data. Okay? So this raw data, what you do, is sometimes you collect a lot of data, but you have to really do uh, two things here called feature engineering and feature scaling. Okay, so those uh, two terms just basically mean once you collect data, you need to really analyze if this data is useful for the use case that you're trying to do. Like, let's just say for the prediction of house prices, right? There is no point in uh, you getting the shape of the plot. Like, I don't feel like that really adds too much into what the final output of the model can give you right so you want to look at more things like how many square footage the house is right uh, or how many floors is it how many rooms does it have is it in a very posh area these are the sort of stuff that that are more uh, that have higher chance of predicting uh, uh, the final outcome right so once you pre-process the data you end up with a little bit more of clean data right and the clean data typically what you do with any machine learning sense is you always split the data into certain sections like you take a certain section of that data and you say hey look this is my training data and the test data now why training and testing so typically for any machine learning application you build a model right the model is nothing but a statistical statistical model that means you'll say hey look uh, given this data what can we infer right that's basically what the whole model is right and so you basically use the training data to train it and once you've trained it how is the uh, in typical typical um, uh, traditional programming, you always know the outcome of it because you know the algorithm of it, right? In machine learning, it's a little less. Uh, you don't really understand the outcome of it unless you have something to test it against, right? So you have test data, right? That you use from this data only, that is facts. So these are all facts, right? So you use the fact itself to check if the model is able to predict the fact in the correct sense, right? And then you have validating validation data. So uh, once, this, once you're satisfied with this model, that means you feel like, hey, look, this model is actually performing uh, the way you want it to perform, you go to model evaluation. In model eva evaluation, you actually feed it in new data. Okay, this is an any machine learning cycle. This is how it works. 
right? You always feed it brand new data and see if it's performing well. And if, even if it performs well here, that means you've built a really excellent model, right? And don't be surprised if your uh, uh, models come out at only 50 to 60% of accuracy, because I've seen like way worse, even 40% sometimes are even like really accurate models for some use cases, right? But yeah, and then you take this and you put it to deployment if everybody's happy with it. And I'd like to talk about the machine learning life cycle. So what is the life cycle of machine learning, right? So in a typical business setting, you always have a business uh, problem that you're solving. So in our case, we are solving for search and recommended systems, right? So that means we try to show you content that you really want to see on the platform. So you start off at a business goal, you convert the business goal into a machine learning problem, right? You, pro you actually convert it into a problem that, that, itself, that in itself is a big uh, task, right? Because if the, the company can just tell you, hey, look, go uh, find stuff that can recommend, but it's again in your head to go find data for it, you have to find models that fit it. You have to find the use case for, for it. And you also have to look at stuff like, um, um, you know, you, you can't recommend like certain type of content just because of uh, content policies on the platform itself. It has to adhere to all of these. So designing stuff like that becomes a huge problem when it comes to machine learning, right? And you have data processing. Like I told you, you go gathering data, you're building it, and then you go to model development. So that's again a cycle. So you do a model development, you test it. If it's not performing well, you get better data, you come back. So that's why this feedback loop, right? So these, I think 90% of machine learning uh, people working in the data science field, they know like these two are the, like 90% of your time is just spent in this, finding better data and developing models, okay? And then once the business team is happy with your requirement, once you are happy with your requirement, you push it to deployment, right? From deployment, you monitor it, right? Uh, you say, hey, look, uh, once it goes out the feature is it actually performing the way we want it are people happy with it if people are not happy with it you go back to the model de uh, development and back on this cycle and then uh, if everybody's happy with it that's well and good and eventually a new business goal comes back and then you're running back in the cycle again and again and again right you do all of this but also adhering to all your other stuff you would keep uh, security i think opti cost optimization this is one of the biggest things uh, since i'm in a startup i know like it's very difficult to pitch uh, a machine learning idea and get funding for it because just how costly they are in de uh, developing and deploying and running also. Operational costs also run pretty high on uh, uh, machine learning models, right? Yeah, uh, right. So I'll be talking about some common terminologies, right? I've already mentioned these. And a label is just basically for a data set if uh, so you have independent and dependent variables, yeah? So dependent and independent variables, as they already suggest from their name, are just basically, if something depends on something, let's just take house price prediction, like I've already taken in uh, the prior case. If you have to predict the house price, you can already say the, how, the price of the house depends mainly uh, on the uh, this thing, what? The square footage of the house, the number of floors on the house. So these are a lot of independent variables. The dependent variable is basically, uh, is the price, right? So basically the price here is, you could think of it as a label or in the case of me giving the cat and dog, okay, cat and dog example. So the label is basically the cat and the dog, right? Features are, be, um, this thing, what the uh, image itself is the feature, an example. So an example is, uh, I can show you this. So this is an example. Do I have the data set? Yes. So you can take this as an example, right? Uh, and we have price in this, yes. So you can take this as a label and this is just a feature. These are all features that are all predefined, right? You, this is all data that you can you previously gather, right? You have labeled and unlabeled examples, right? In this case, I have labeled examples because I'm taking the example of a supervised machine learning model. In case of unlabeled examples, you just have data without any labels for it, right? And models are the ones that help you in predicting uh, what basically the model is. So in this case, we're using linear regression, right? For predicting the price of a house. Right, so I'll be talking about a small example in supervised learning that is predicting the house prices, okay? So we'll be using a very basic machine learning model called regression. That means um, regression, uh, if some of you are familiar with, is just basically fitting a line. It's a best fit curve that you use to fit a bunch of data points, right? So for this, what you typically do is 
um, for any machine learning problem, yeah, these are the seven steps that you would always take from going from a problem till solution. I think this is something that uh, uh, every machine learning uh, engineer looks at. Right? First, you frame the problem. Right? What is the problem that you are really trying to solve? Right? So, in our case, what is the price of the house? Given X. Given X is in. In my case, is like what a bedroom, bathroom stories. I think I'm pretty sure I have areas also. Yeah, areas here, right? And we also have additional data. Make a hypothesis, right? So in a typical sense, you always make hypothesis saying, hey, look, this can be a factor, right? Let's say um, I made a hypothesis here, like rooms is a factor, right? Sometimes you do make wrong hypothesis. That's fine that you uh, finally come back to it when you make refine and repeat. But you always make a general hypothesis based on common sense, right? Then you go and collect data. So in this case, I've made like number of rooms is a factor. So I've gone collected data on number of rooms, house prices, et cetera, et cetera, many more, right? And then you test the hypothesis. So basically hypothesis testing is a separate sense in statistical listing. That means you're just basically testing if what hypothesis you've made, is it good? Is it like, uh, does it hold good against like real, uh, real world examples, right? I'll be showing how to do hypothesis. I wouldn't be showing how to do hypothesis testing, but I can show you uh, some basic things is a uh, correlation factor, right? You can look at correlation factors, right? Analyze the result, right? Once you, uh, then uh, I think step uh, 4.5 here comes as actually building it. Then you analyze the result, you reach a conclusion, is the model a good fit? Is it really solving? Is it really predicting house prices? And then if, uh, if it is, well and good, can we find a better model if uh, for, for higher accuracy? If yes, you go. If the model is not doing good, go find a better model, right? So I'll be showing a very small demo here. If the demo works, right? So I just have basically some housing data, okay? In this housing data. So uh, one thing you need to be aware is every time you go and find data, there are always data in different formats, right? Here you can see data is half of it is in numerical format and the rest of is in uh, categorical format, yeah? So uh, since you uh, find data in categorical format, you typically take it and you convert it to all numerical format because uh, majority of machine learning models take data or they represent data eventually as numbers itself. There is no character representation to my knowledge of any data that's represented, right? So we load the data, hopefully, yes. So the data the shape, so I have 554 uh, records out of which I have 13 parameters. Okay, I think 12 is the correct uh, this thing because price is something we'll eventually end up predicting, but we also have data for this, okay? So this is basically a describe. Describe uh, is basically, if you guys are familiar with uh, pandas, um, it just describes the data set on finding standard deviation and stuff like this is good for you for, uh, we call this actually in machine learning, we call this EDA, okay? Explore, uh, exploring data, right? You basically do a little bit of analysis on if this data is a good representation of what you're looking for, okay? And then you look for if you have found any empty data, right? Because typically what happens is when you, like I told you, pre-processing data, sometimes you might not end up, sometimes in some places you might not end up getting the data, so you leave it empty. So in this case, luckily all the data points are like I've specifically chosen a data set that doesn't have anything empty. Right, just to keep things simple. But if it has empty, you can do stuff like filling it with average values, right? Let's just say for some price, you don't know the house. I mean, I, would, I, I don't think I'd, I can choose price. Let's just take area, right? If you're taking stuff in the general area, right? if this and this and the other house are quite near, so you can say approximately that house also comes in this general sense. So you can take an average of uh, stuff around that place and choose, uh, choose to, choose, uh, you can use that as a value, right? So if there are missing values, that is. Right, and for some of you, you might already be aware of what box plot is. Box plot is this basically our quartile ranges, right? And basically, all this data is so extreme away from the mean. Okay, so in uh, I think one thing you will always learn in machine learning is you always try to uh, fit all your um, uh, what do you call your data points within a certain set of ranges. Okay, just because it makes the model also quite simple, and also it ensures that your final output of the model is not skewed, okay? Uh, that means you will not feel like a model is biased to certain set of data, right? So what we do is uh, we explore the data first, 
And after exploring the data, we remove data that we feel like doesn't fall in the quartile range. This is a very common uh, thing that you do in statistics. You remove stuff that falls out of the interquartile range, right? And after removing stuff, because these are all outside the extreme, right? Let's just say, uh, if I were to give you a good example in this, let's just say you go to a house, right? And you ask the house guy, like, hey, look, it's a very small house. It's a one floor house. And that guy's asking some insane amount of money for it. Like that, that one example does not, uh, is, is, is a very bad example for you to train your data on, right? Because your training data is the one that represents your model itself. So you'd want to remove stuff like that. Right, so here this basically does that, right? You're removing anything outside that falls outside this. Okay, I think I might have written the same thing twice. Oops, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. And, and yeah, and then once after visualizing it after that, you see like the data is a little bit more concentrated, right? You see it's, it's all spread out all the way through, whereas now it falls a little bit more in the sense. Yeah. Right, so this plot isn't really important. This is just for you to visualize the data, right? So you can see, uh, so in the general sense, when looking at this is really important. So you can see as the area increases, the price also increases, right? There are some extremes here, but yeah. So in the general sense, as area increase increasing, price also is increasing in that general sense itself, right? So this is good for you as a guy designing machine learning models to understand uh, how certain factors uh, are affecting others, right? So these are just more, um, it's basically the same thing, but the only thing I've done is uh, for categorical data, since there is categorical data in this, right, there's yes and no in these. I've just converted them to the same thing, to yes and no, and taken the representation of it in a box plot. Right? I think more importantly than that, yes here. So this is the one thing that I took to show you guys. So um, like I told you, if you have categorical data, one thing you can do is called one out encoding, right? One out encoding is just basically you have data that is uh, uh, represented as not as numericals, and you want to convert them, right? So you typically convert them. So these are all objects, and once you do one out encoding, you'll say, hey, if it is yes, you represent it as a one. You can do the other way also. You can represent yes as zero and one uh, no as one. Is left to your choice. It's for the simplicity and intuition, right? For everybody. So I've just kept it simple that yes is one and no is zero, right? But you'll also see like there is this one last one here which doesn't fall under just yes and no, right? So that, what you do is, you, um, so you represent them as one not encodings only, but you represent them as separate fields, right? So you say, hey, if this is true, then you represent it as one, right? So we actually end up dropping this in our final representation, yes, so you end up dropping this but yes, and so once it's finally done, right? So data goes in like this. Okay, you see yes and no. And once you apply the I think I apply the function here, yeah. So data comes out in this sense, right? You're representing everything as numericals now, and it's much easier to handle. Right? So and yeah. So like I told you, now you've come to the point where you have uh, done your, uh, you've collected your data, you pre-processed your data, and you have clean data now. Okay. Now, once you've, uh, once you actually have clean data, uh, yeah. So you basically split it like I told you. You take a test set and a train set. Okay. In the test set, this this amount of data. That means I'm choosing 30% of the data here to test data on, and I'm doing 70% of it to train the data on. Right. So. 0.7 into how many other rows? I think I had 500 rows, right? So that's around 300, 350 examples or something is for actually for training. And the rest of it is for testing, right? And I'm just showing you this. It just basically, this just prints the data. Yeah, so this one thing we do feature scaling. Okay, I won't go too much into feature scaling. So like I told you, uh, you actually scale the features to represent it in the similar sense. So if you see data is all, like some of it is insanely high, right? Data is being represented as in the millions, whereas in this, it's all being represented in numbers less from zero to 10. So we try to represent everything within certain ranges. So in this case, chosen it from zero to one, right? Just because it makes, uh, I think it's statistically better, okay? 
models perform statistically better when you apply feature scaling, right? You'll see a lot of this in most of the data sets that you do, right? And one thing, uh, this is the correlation matrix. So correlation matrix is really excellent. This also falls under ED only in understanding which features are uh, directly proportional, right? So if you look at area, area will always be highly proportional to price, right? 0.56 is a very strong um, uh, correlation, uh, this thing, a value. So correlation value falls from zero to one. That means if it's negative, that means see, uh, furnished and price don't really fall, fall under the same this thing, unfurnished and price, right? They basically say, hey, look, if it's higher, uh, higher probability of this, the price goes down, okay? This is general sense, but I think it makes more sense with uh, numerical values, right? Because these are all categorical, so it's a little hard to take a sense. Should I take, I think even bedrooms and price also should generally have a general. So see, bedrooms and price have a positive value. That means, hey, look, if the bedrooms increases, price also increases, right? But it's not that strong as what area is. So you see that area plays a major factor always in price, okay? This is one way to do it. There's actually another way called RFE. RFE basically does is um, recurring feature uh, extraction. Right here also, you can use this small model to find, uh, so let's just take six. If you want to do uh, learning on six features, right? this gives you the top six features. So it says, hey, look, area is the best. Stories are also good. Stories are, I think these are floors, if I'm not wrong. Parking and uh, preferred area. <clears throat> Right, these are, I think, one, two, three, right? And if I were to say which is the best one, I think it says area, yeah. So it says basically, it says, look, area is the best feature to choose if you want to predict price, right? Um, so with this, you create a class for this, typical programming, and then you fit the model, right? Fitting the model is basically saying as in training itself, right? What we saw in the previous slides, you basically train the model itself. You say, hey, look, this is the data sets that we have seen. Oh wait, uh, I think one thing I forgot to tell you. Yeah. So since data is represented as this, this is your training set itself, right? So you basically choose this section without the price, everything here has your uh, X, X value. Basically X value is your uh, uh, this thing, what? Um, uh, my God, I forgot the word. Features, yes, features. <laughs> you choose it as your features, right? And then you choose your price as the label itself, right? So you basically fitted your features and your labels. You're saying, hey, look, for this particular set of examples, that means something with area of this, uh, so many bedrooms, so many bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is giving a price of so much, right? So this basically, if you see the array of these, I think I'll print that out for you guys here. You can see there is no price in this, and you can see these labels are also, yeah. So it's basically the same thing, but you're just feeding it in here, right? You're basically saying, no, not here, here, yeah. So you're basically saying, hey, look, take this, and these are the values for this. For this, this should be the output of it. And linear regression goes, does its thing. So basically it uses gradient descent, um, not again, not going too much into gradient descent. That's it's just basically the cost function that comes into linear regression. Yeah. And so, if uh, most of you guys are aware, uh, linear regression always has the factor of y is equal to m x plus c, right? Where this is only with one uh, variable, right? Since uh, if you're taking only one, that means if I'm dealing it only with price. But I think here I'm dealing with another twelve more uh, uh, features. So this will basically, this will eventually turn out to be y is equal to m, mx1 plus m2x2, right? m2x2 and so on. Like it keeps going on and on for how many other features you have. M, mx plus x, uh, m subscript x and x subscript x plus c. C is always, uh, because linear regression is again, uh, it's just a line, right? You're finding the best fit line. So it's just basically the equation of a line itself that comes here. So you have the coefficients. So I think how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, 10, 13. There are 13 features, right? So you have, so once you fit the model, 
this linear regression model will give you the coefficients of these. And the, these are basically m values, right? You find all the m values, and this is the intercept is the c value, right? And then you basically pick uh, you have a test data, right? In the test data, I've dropped the price, and once you, uh, and I've fed it, right? Because you don't want to feed the price in it because that's something you have to take output, and you get the price in this, and these are all scaled down. So you multiply this by I think we have scaled it down by a million. So you multiply it by that, and you have the output for it, right? And you can use a cost function for this. Cost functions can be uh, R square values or even MSE, right? Mean squared errors, right? And say, hey, look, this is the accuracy for it. Yeah. And I like to give you some recommended resources for this. So you guys can use this. I think this is probably one of the best uh, resources for this is this, the second one, right? And this is uh, MIT is a Microsoft resource. Right, so that's really helpful, and yeah, that's the talk about today. Anyway, thank you on this, and hopefully you guys can feel free to ask me questions on this if you have any. Yeah, thank you, Tarun. Great talk. Uh, very simple and uh, nicely explained with that example. Anyone has questions? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Bushan. Yeah. Hi, Darren. Thank you for the insights on ML. Actually, I'm uh, quite new to machine learning and I'm, I'm totally from a different background. I'm a sysadmin <laughs> for Unix. So I was just curious, like, is this, uh, uh, I, mean, like, I mean, like, am I a candidate for ML? It could be a, you know, career shift transformation for me to, work on ml is that is that uh, you know scenario that i can see or i need to learn something before you know going into that that shift was yeah, i am I, not yeah go ahead yes 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 yeah, yeah so i think that's a really good question to ask uh, it's the right question to ask also so i tell anybody who tries is trying to really get into the field of machine learning that you really have to learn your maths and statistics really really well okay i know a lot of people uh, Programming is one thing, okay. But uh, always remember, like machine learning people don't do programming quite a lot. Their their guys are sitting in a room, <laughs> like figuring out which is the best machine learning model to fit, right? Programming is very simple. What is programming? Programming is just interpretation of your thoughts, right? Yeah. So, I would say, if you really want to shift, okay, is mm -hmm. really uh, understand mathematics and statistics for it. I think uh, even some stuff like, uh, I don't know if you've gone across Coursera as a very basic course on what they give on machine learning, right? Uh, even that also doesn't do justice to what you need to actually know to be a good machine learning engineer. Because see in the field, right? In whatever I do day to day, mm -hmm. I also build stuff, but after building stuff, I think one of the very difficult things that comes across in machine learning is explaining why this is happening. Right, and okay. you, you'll only be able to explain why something is happening in a sense that it is. Uh, let's just say you feed in a machine learning model, something, mm -hmm. right? and you mm -hmm. get an output that is not desired. So what business does? Business will always ask, "Hey, look, this output has come. Like, what have you built? Like, it's common sense that this output should not come. Right? This is very common in machine learning. Okay, this is believe me, it happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Okay. Like you, you've seen on LinkedIn also, sometimes you'll see uh, LinkedIn also uses recommendation or any platform. I wouldn't point out a, a platform here. You'll always go in it and you'll feel like, yeah, what am I looking at in my recommendation, uh, recommendations? Mm -hmm. stuff, right? okay. So explaining that is very difficult in uh, machine learning. And that's something that people can do only if you really understand the mathematics behind it. Okay, mathematics and statistics. So mm -hmm. if you really want to excel in the field, I would say, hey, look, really work on your mathematics and statistics. Programming, um, I feel like anybody can catch on. I, in the way uh, the world is being built right now on how free everything is, um, mm -hmm. don't worry too much on your programming. Learn a lot about mathematics and statistics. And uh, I would say uh, anybody who's really trying to shift to this field, do a lot of Kaggle. Right? Get your certifications. Yes, certifications are good. Uh, which, but, which certification uh, you mentioned? Uh, so there is a Coursera certification that is by yes, Coursera, correct. Andrew NG, okay? It's good. Okay. I did actually, I've, I've, I've never done it, but I just did go through this right before this because I know somebody would ask this question. It is good. Mm 
uh, but all my expertise that I've gained is through the IIT Madras data science course. Okay, so there, you know, uh, I really learned what statistics and mathematics are required to be an ML engineer. Okay. okay, I'm thankful I took this course, right? Uh, even though I'm a working professional, I'm doing it, uh, studying it off, uh, and in my free time only. Mm -hmm. So okay. I don't, I don't know if that course is uh, fit for some of you, depending on. Right, you can evaluate it. Uh, you can check it on IIT Madras's website. Right, this is an online BSc degree course on data science. Mm -hmm. right? But yeah, I would recommend anybody. Your mathematics and your statistics need to be top notch. Right. Okay. So, so basically, the statistics and mathematics you mentioned is the like you know like algebra or like that way. You're yes, doing? exactly, exactly. Your linear algebra. Mm -hmm. So linear algebra yeah. is the fundamentals of machine learning. That's, mm -hmm. that's literally okay. any machine learning guy should know. And statistics in the sense like hypothesis testing, um, mm -hmm. this thing, <clears throat> converting like a, like a, today I did converting categorical variables to numerical variables. Right, these are all yeah. very fundamentals of statistics, and these are all stuff that you do day in and day out in machine learning. Okay. All right. Okay. So, these is there any any variables. kind of you know like uh, you know what I could say is like assessment or something like that for us like how how good i am in the statistics how good i am in linear algebra something like that uh, because i think that is the only way to you know like evaluate because i cannot just say that i am good in you know statistics because i just you know i know a few facts so that way is the course you know like does that what you suggested the course right the the coaching from Coursera, yeah. does that does that do that to us? Like, you know, give any assessment to us to understand, like, if we are at least, you know, that at least at the minimum level of uh, uh, statistics we understand to take a step forward. No, sir, I don't think uh, from what brief I've gone through in the course, I don't think mm -hmm. it does justice in you teaching. So there is a new course that he's actually put out. I didn't check that course out. It is mathematics and the the mathematics behind machine learning or something is put out by Andrew Ng. Mathematics okay. behind a study. Okay. Machine learning. So take okay. a shot at that question. Uh, see, Bushan, um, there is no spoon feeding here. Right. You, yeah. you have to come with a level of maturity from where you have to take it forward. Mm -hmm. If somebody has to spoon feed right from the scratch, uh, your linear algebra, your probability, your statistics, your programming, it's not going to happen. You have to bring your level of maturity into the program and do your bit and then things will fall in place but if you're okay. expecting is everything going to be taught no uh, then yeah, you are not right. made for right. uh, machine learning <laughs> yeah that's right yeah but that's as you remember I, sorry uh, i took this andrew ng course long back i didn't complete it as i remember they just say that uh, uh, school level that is high school level algebra is a good starting point that is enough to get started yeah, that's they what don't we expect like, you uh, to be an expert in algebra. High school level algebra, algebra if you know, you can get started with. Uh, correct, because that's course. the yeah. level you know, like everybody will be at least aware of. Because like if they are expecting yeah. like, you know, like like a master's in statistics, so that is altogether different story. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I think. What uh, that uh, instructor means is that uh, you better revise at least that. Because you, mm. we might have done this high school thing long back. We might have forgotten. Right. Correct, correct. So correct. at least revise it once before you start the course. Okay. So yeah. like uh, Ramanathan part. said, uh, yeah, we have to do our bit to be ready for the course. Like basics should be in place. Otherwise, right. everything will look alien. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for your inputs. I will definitely. Yeah, all the try best. My best yeah. To, yeah. In Take fact, yeah. uh, uh, it's uh, interesting that Tarun mentioned uh, the mathematics behind machine learning. About right. three, four years back, I think four, four, five years back, Ramanathan did a series, the math behind ML. He gave a series of talks in Beehive workspace in uh, Residency Road. So that was well attended by a lot of people. Okay. So yeah, probably, uh, yeah, we should consider that again. And the way Ramanathan does these things, he uses nothing more than an Excel file. Not even a Python code or anything. With Excel, he will explain beautifully how machine learning works. Okay, great. Yeah. So maybe we can do one of the one of those talks in a future session. 
Okay, yeah, that would be helpful. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Tarun. Thank you so much for your Any further you. questions from others? We have time. I also have a couple of comments and questions, but uh, I'll give a chance to the audience first. Okay, let me ask my question in, in, in the meantime. Uh, Tarun, you mentioned this one example where uh, what do you call categorical data, furnished, semi-furnished, and unfurnished, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you made it three features, zero and one. Yes, sir. So my question is, can we not instead have a single feature and say zero, one, two? Will that work just as well? Will that work just as well? I think that's a good question. I might have to revisit my model and try that out. Yeah, because I don't have hands-on experience, so I just got this idea, which is the better way. Yeah. No, that. So, sorry. Yeah, Ramanathan, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, that please, please. may not, that wouldn't work. See, in this case, if it is ordinal, it might work to an extent. This is absolutely categorical variable. What are the three yeah. variable three values? Uh, so furnished, unfurnished, and semi-furnished. So these are the three. Okay. Uh, so yeah. furnished, unfurnished, and semi-furnished. You yes. see this as a categorical variable. Let's say unfurnished is zero, semi-furnished is one, fully furnished is two. If you yeah. look at it as an ordinal variable, yes, to some extent it will work. Encode it properly. Otherwise, uh, if it is purely categorical variable, then no. Ordinal yeah, or yeah. categorical. I understand is what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I understood what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So I've converted it. So my approach has been to convert it to more of an indicator variable. That means to say yes or no if it, it is present or not. So uh, I I mean I could give this a try. Probably that'd be something that I can add in my next talk. So that'd be good. And it need not be zero on two always. It can yes, be zero, yes, ten, yes. and hundred. Yeah. It is yes, how yes. much weightage you give to semi furnished and furnished. What works for you? Mm -hmm. The other question I had was in one of your slides, uh, you showed uh, different types of machine learning and then dimensionality reduction was also there, which was like an offshoot of uh, what unsupervised learning, right? Yes, yes, sir. But uh, I thought dimensionality reduction is general. It can apply for supervised learning also, isn't it? Suppose you have uh, 100 features, you can reduce it to a smaller set, can you not? For sure, for sure. Uh, I think the more, I think from my understanding of dimensionality reduction is, is for you to actually find features that are actually useful for you to work with. Okay. I think that's the okay. of dimensionality reduction. Yeah. No, is there a, no, just, just a thought process. Is there a thing in practice that it is more common in unsupervised than in supervised? Is there something like that general statement? Uh, from what I see, are, so are you saying a dimension reduction is a field in? Are no, you is it more, more commonly used in unsupervised rather than in supervised? That is my question. Or this, that is not a correct statement. Uh, I don't think that's a correct statement. So, from my understanding of dimension reduction is, let's just say you have uh, for you are doing fraud detection, yeah. Mm. And now in this fraud detection, you probably have hundreds of variables, but you don't really know what which variable to pick up to build the model, mm. right? So in that fraud detection, you'll say, hey, look, this is a pattern that's generally been followed. Go find this pattern within this data and find which are the main parameters that are causing this, right? Mm. So it still falls under the field where you don't really know what you're looking for and you're expecting the program to find these general patterns. So it really does fall under the, completely on the uh, field of unsupervised itself, right? Okay. Is what my understanding is. Uh, but yeah, hopefully. My last question uh, was uh, in your data, you did scaling, right? Uh, to zero to scaling. one. Yeah, feature scaling. Yeah. yeah. You don't scale the price, right? Obviously. That is the Y variable. No, no, no. We scale that also, sir. Okay, that also you scale. Then yeah, we when you do prediction, uh, will it not give only to that scaled uh, range? Yeah, yeah, it will. Uh, so then you just uh, multiply it by whatever your scaled value is, right? So it gives you how it has scaled. Uh, it gives you the scaling factor, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 
So that is the additional step you have to write in code. After you get the predicted value, you yes, have to scale yes, it yes. back. Scale it back, scale it back. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I need to add these small points. Thank you for noting these down. Help this improve. Help me improve this. One interesting in your chart, no? There is a. You can bring it up. Uh, there is a correlation chart. Oh yeah, wait. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I was on the pretext that I was sharing still. So in Please. the chart, I noticed one interesting thing, which is nothing to do with price, because normally we are looking at the how price is correlated with the features, right? Base chart, right? No, I can't see your screen. It will be helpful oh, to the visible? participants. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing. Yes. 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 Ah, this one. Yeah. Yeah. See, normally we are looking at price versus the features. And we are looking yeah. at the dark areas. Like yeah. 0 0.56 highly correlated and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So one thing I found interesting is if you look at, for example, uh, there is one between uh, bedrooms and uh, something. So we can find bedrooms here, basement, bedrooms here. So you can see. Semi furnished oh, bedrooms, bedroom and bedrooms and stories. You look at that uh, intersection. Bedrooms versus Point stories. Four? Yeah, 0. Point 0.4. Four. So, this yeah. is an interesting insight I found because typically the two BHKs are on the lower floor, three BHKs higher floors. Penthouse, which okay. is five BHK, it is on the top floor. Yeah. So, sometimes you get insights like this when you look at data. Yeah, so that's the whole point of EDA itself. So exploratory data analysis, we call this. It's a, a process within the machine learning life cycle. I've not actually split it down into every single field. So this is basically the, the whole point of EDA is for you to get insights on what could be. You you generally build a, you build a general intuition when you're building yeah. a model, right? So that's all. This is visualizations is just for building intuition on what could be right. Anyone else has questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I would like to conclude by sharing my screen. It's uh, re very relevant to this topic. So those of you who are absolutely new to machine learning on Devopedia, there are two high level articles on machine learning. So there is one article titled machine learning. So this will give you the uh, big picture. What exactly is machine learning? So like Tarun said, you feed in data. There's an algorithm that learns from the data and it outputs the model. Then you can mo use the model, feed in the, you know, uh, your access, then it will predict the Y. Right? So that is what you are trying to get uh, from here. There is another uh, article called machine learning model. This article focuses more on the model itself. Right, so you can start by reading this article on machine learning. It explains how machines learn uh, some of this. Uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of this, you know, uh, Tarun has explained supervised and supervised reinforcement. So it's all the same thing. Regression we talked about. He talked about regression as an example. Right, he def defined some of the features, labels, etc. So all that is described here. And then you can go and read this article, which focuses more on the model itself. So this uh, image also was there in Tarun's slide. How traditional programming works, how a machine learning system works. So this is the comparison. And then it explains uh, machine learning and machine learning model through examples and so on. Right. So some of the terms, uh, you know, uh, Tarun used, he may not have explained because it's an introductory talk, but you can learn about it from this article. It explains structure, loss function, optimizer, and so on. Right. So this again, uh, uh, you know, it's an introduction, but this is a good place to get started. So I just wanted to share these two articles, and uh, of course there are many more articles on our site but you can get started with these two.